Well, you know that for the past years, we've been a little over a year, on Wednesday nights we've been in a study on the principles of the message of faith and as it relates to divine healing. And we've covered one of our major considerations here in this study, which is just what is God's will in this matter. We're certainly hear, hearing a lot of competing voices around telling us it is or isn't God's will to heal or to bless or to prosper his people or to completely deliver them from demon spirits and so forth. And we are past that for now. <clears throat> and it would be fine and well if that were good enough. It would be fine and well if all we needed to know was the will of God concerning the issue of divine healing. But it's not enough. That's right. Because there are a whole lot of people who have settled on that, who are settled on the fact that it is the will of God to bless them, that it is the will of God to heal them, that it is the will of God to get them out of difficulties or problems. They're settled on that. They even write books on that. And yet a little study of their life reveals the fact that they're not experiencing some of those blessings that they so greatly believe in. Amen. So we come to a second major point that we've been on for a number of months uh, also, and that is the will of man as it relates to receiving from God. The will of man as it relates to receiving from God. One of our basic texts has been John chapter 5, first few verses there, especially verse 6, but the story of the man, the lame man, the impotent man, there lying by the pool. And we read there in John chapter 5, whenever Jesus came upon him, and this is reading this account with all of our knowledge that we have concerning the Lord's will in the matter of healing. He told the leper in Matthew 8, you know, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean, I will be thou clean. There's the will of God. I will be healed. I will. There's God's will. Even with all of that, he comes up to this man and said, wilt thou be made whole? Now that's a surprise. The obvious deduction we would make is the, the will of man must have some role to play in whether or not he receives from God or doesn't receive from God. Even though God is abundantly willing to bless and to heal, the will of man must have some role in that. And I've said before it ought to be obvious just from a look around us on the globe today. God's willing to heal, is he not? Aren't we all agreed on that? Well, why aren't people healed everywhere all over the world? You say, well, they don't meet, you know, some condition somewhere. Well, that's the whole point. Man must have some role in it there. And one crucial one that we've seen here is, is he willing to receive from God? Not everybody who says they're willing is willing to receive from God. And so we've been looking at some various ways by which our willingness is uh, short-circuited, such as apathy. I guess that's probably the, the biggest way. People are just apathetic. People who have already come to the fact that they agree, you know, with divine healing or whatever, or that they want to get something from God, remain too often, more often maybe than not, at least for some people, in a state of apathy. And because they're apathetic concerning the promises of God, they don't receive from him. God's willing. That end of the situation is abundantly taken care of, but they're not willing. We looked earlier at some of the various channels by which apathy works. The first of those was forgetfulness. Forgetfulness. Now, if you've only been in this walk one or two or three years, then this won't apply for you. <laughs> That's right. Whenever you've been in it a year or two, you know, you just barely tasted of that new wine, the heavenly gift, and you're just claiming everything left and right. But you hang around until you get some barnacles growing on you like some people have. I will confess myself, but some people. How long have you been in it? You can name to yourself the years. What is it, two years, eight years? Well, you're getting on up there. This is the barnacle stage now. <laughs> Ten years, 15. You just got to remember that, and it's like anything else, if you haven't been there to that 15-year stage, and some of us are there right now. Some of people are at the 20-year stage. Some of us are at the 15-year stage. If you haven't been there yet, then, then maybe you need to take someone else's advice for what you could be in store for. I've seen a lot of people fall by the wayside. Amen. You know, they go for a while in this. And you could say it maybe one of two ways. Depending on what you're trying to emphasize, you could make opposite points. You could say the first few years are the most difficult. I mean, you could say that. Why? Well, the devil's going to really bring an all-out attack to get you stopped there because he don't want you to mature in the faith or he'll never overcome you then. Or if you're presenting it from another point of view, like tonight, you could say the first few years are the easiest years. 
Why? Well, God deals with you tenderly. Amen. You're not an aged, gray-haired saint yet. He deals with you tenderly. And he allows you to get away with things, and he just gives you popsicles all the time. <laughs> he just gives you those blessings all the time. And then you, you're up to your seventh year, and then your ninth year, and your twelfth year, and then your fifteenth year. And a lot of people have entered the barnacle stage around there. Not the Barnabas, the barnacle. <laughs> You know, they're kind of immobile and things are growing on them. And they don't have enough of whatever to knock those things off and get moving. They just kind of become encrusted with that. So apathy, forgetfulness, I guess the reason I'm saying that is if this is your first or second or third or whatever year in this, you think, I would never forget to read my Bible or to pray or to seek first the kingdom or to rebuke symptoms. I would never forget that. Well, no, no not for the first three years or however long. But you stay in it for a while. And well, you know, this is kind of routine. Going to a doctor, you know, that's just so, that's so far into all of us, most of us anyway. It's been so many years that that's not one of the things you quibble over or wonder about or argue over or whatever. I mean, I remember whenever we first heard this word many years ago, and, and we kind of heard it in a kind of a mixed way, then, then we weren't for sure now, is what is being said here, what we think is being said, that it's all God and no doctors? Then how can we have, you know, charismatics who are friends of ours, who are medical doctors and all of this? It just didn't seem to mesh there. And so that was something we had to think about for a while. It didn't take us very long because we can't find any doctors in the Bible except the physicians in Egypt or Babylon, you know, where the people are going. But God was the healer of his people, Exodus 15, 26. But you stay in this for a few years, though, and then all of a sudden you have an opportunity presented to you whether or not you're going to end up in an apathetic state. And one of the channels by which apathy works is forgetfulness. The need is too small, you're too busy, you take things for granted. Whatever the reason there, you're apathetic. Or another reason I've said, another channel by which apathy can enter into people's lives is the abundance, the availability of the substitutes, the alternatives around us today. Now this is certainly true. I think we can really clearly see this with regard to healing and medical science. What if you didn't have doctors on every corner and pharmacists and druggists and hospitals and ambulances and fire stations and emergency squads and paramedics and, you know, these hot numbers that you dial and somebody's just there. They'll send a helicopter or a speedboat, a, a, a airboat through the Everglades or whatever to get you wherever you are incapacitated and take you somewhere to man's medical shrine to fix you all up. What if you didn't have that? You see, you may be forced to trust God or die one or the other. But because medical science is so available and it's cheap everywhere around us, you think, trust God? You ever tried to present this total faith message to an acquaintance or a neighbor, relative, friend, former friend? They were a friend that you attempted to impress upon their mind this truth. And, you know, it's really hard to get people to even believe this. It is a work of grace in their life for them to surrender what is easy. It's Blue Cross, Blue Shield. It's all these payments they've already made, their insurance, to surrender all of that or to never get involved in it, depending on their age. That's very difficult. Now, I'm no expert on what happens overseas. I don't know that it's tremendously better over there, but I know it's terrible here in this country because medical science because various of the substitutes for the word of god are so available the alternatives are so plenteous and abundant around us then people grow apathetic people get in the faith walk and stay for a while and then their trial that they have been enduring that is supposed to be found in the praise and honor and glory of jesus christ in his appearing first peter 1 6 and 7 the trial that they have been enduring it's just that they've been enduring for three or four years and it's not getting any better maybe it's worse but it's certainly not better i expected the first time i claimed this to be healed at least by now and it's not getting any better and i can't do this or i'm you know inhibited or prohibited from doing that and so i got to find some way to get around this and there's a doctor available somewhere fifty dollars maybe for a doctor call and thirty dollars for some pills or whatever you need your prescription you can be on your way and I know people who have fallen into some of these snares over the years. And I know people who've fallen into these snares and have never gotten out of them. Never gotten out of them. The easy availability of medical science around makes it very difficult to convince people of the privilege and the pleasure of trusting God. 
and of convincing them of the other side of that also. It's not only a privilege and a pleasure, but it's a command and a responsibility not to trust in ourselves, not to lean to our own understanding, Amen. not to trust in men or put our confidence in them, but to trust in God. Amen. That is a privilege to be able to do that. That's right. That's right. But whether you count it that or not, it's a command. So you better get busy doing it. Amen. I just hope that as you obey the command, you find what a pleasure and what a privilege it is. Amen. Didn't we used to sing, "'Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus? <laughs> and what a mockery the church has made of the message of faith and singing that song and doing anything and everything but trusting in him. So in John 5, we read, Wilt thou be made whole? And we also have been using a passage in Matthew 20, and Mark gives us the account in a little different form in chapter 10 of his gospel of two blind men who came to Jesus. And Jesus didn't just say, well, think to himself, well, they're stumbling here. People have to leave them here. Surely what they need is healing for their eyes, so I'll heal them. He asked them the question, what do you want me to do for you? He puts the responsibility back on them. That they come to him, that they come to him, is a proof of the fact he must be willing to heal, or why would they be going to him? That they come to him is a proof of the fact that his willingness, the question of God's willingness, has already been settled. But what about their will? And we have shown you that a whole lot of people, whenever they're confronted with this, even when they say, I'm willing, I'm willing, I'm willing, there's a difference between the adjective willing and the verb to will. They don't will to receive from God. They're willing kind of in a passive state, like, well, if it were to happen, I wouldn't argue against it. <laughs> I mean, if God were to bless me financially, I wouldn't give it back or something like that, but to claim it, to lay out a claim, to stake a claim, to believe, to endure, to wrestle with the devil, <laughs> no, I just don't have the guts for that. Pardon the phrase. I don't have the strength for that. I just don't have the desire for that. Well, you're never going to receive from God. Or you may receive on an occasion whenever you rise to the level, you get inspired by some message to claim something that day or that week. You may on occasion rise to the level and receive from God. But people generally don't whenever they're in a situation like that. And so what I want to do with you tonight is to take a look at some New Testament examples. That they're in the Gospels. We're going to concentrate in Mark here, I guess, primarily. But I'm going to use the example there with the blind men and... Uh, Matthew 20 as well. But here in Mark, some examples in the Gospels of, of just what it means to be willing in the biblical sense. Not just to exist in a passive state of willingness, but to will to receive from God. To will to receive from God. And the way I'd like to study this is to say that there are three keys to a faith that receives from God. This context in which we're discussing it, the will of man as it relates to receiving from God, whether it's receiving your brother and sister saved and baptized in the Holy Spirit or receiving some healing or whatever, whatever promise of God, three keys to a faith that receives from God. I'd like to begin over in Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2, uh, the first few verses here. And I hope you see through these examples in Mark 2 and in Mark 5 and again over in Matthew 20 or the parallel account in Mark chapter 10 that there is a there is a theme of being radical here in these chapters that is not only foreign but it's offensive to church people today uh, maybe even to some charismatics today but we've been talking and talking and talking for several months now about being willing well, now, just what does that mean in the biblical sense? We're not distinguishing now between being willing and willing to, but being willing in the biblical sense, what does it really mean? How do you know whether or not you're willing to receive from God? I think that we all already know in our own heart anyway. We kind of know when we approach God and approach the promises and approach uh, some faith claim of ours kind of in a, a passive, uh, lackadaisical type sense, you know, an apathetic way. I think that we really know. But to help you if you don't really know, your life is going to be characterized by a radical uh, theme of desperation. And I don't mean desperation in some half-crazed, uh, lunatic sense. But I mean it in the sense in which we see it here, that these people, like the man here in Mark chapter 2, has some need in his life. And he's found out who the one is who can meet that lead, meet, need. And he's going to do whatever it takes whatever it takes to get to Jesus 
and to receive his answer. Amen. And if we don't have that, we're not willing in the biblical sense. Woo-hoo! When he asked the man there, wilt thou be made whole? Well, there were a multitude of impotent folk there, we're told, who were, quote, willing, unquote. Why were they there waiting for the moving of the water if they weren't willing to be healed? And yet Jesus only went to one and said, what do you want? Are you willing? Well, what a foolish question. The man's been there 38 years. It's not so foolish after all when you start looking at the anatomy of the human will and the human heart that he's more apathetic than not. He's apathetic more often than not. He can be right there at the pool of Bethesda or the pool of whatever 38, 58 years with a need, knowing that he can get his need perhaps met somewhere around there, and yet never receive it, never receive it. Jesus asked him, are you willing to be healed? Are you willing to receive this? You know, you've been waiting 38 years, and you would never expect that would be the question that the healing evangelist would ask you. Are you willing to get what you've been willing to get for 38 years now? But by Jesus' question like that, it helps to uncover, it helps to go right to the heart of the issue here. The issue of whether or not God is willing to heal or God is willing to bless has forever been settled in heaven. The issue that is never settled until it's settled day by day, case by case, person by person, is the human will. God's will has forever been settled. There's never been a time when he wasn't willing to heal, and there never will be a time when he's not willing to heal. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. That part of the question of divine healing, which is what everybody wants to talk about, well, I don't believe it's God's will. Well, we don't even want to talk to you then. That is so subtle. I mean, we don't serve the type of God you serve who likes to afflict people and keep them ill and sick. We don't even want to talk to you about that. What we're going to talk to you about is, you know the reason you don't receive from God is you don't want to. It's not because you have any valid biblical or theological argument or proof on your side. The reason you don't receive is because you don't want to. You don't what? Well, want is just another form of will. You're not willing to receive from God. Jesus said, will thou be made whole? He asked the two blind men in Matthew 20, what will you? What will you have me do for you? What are you willing? What do you want for me to do for you? Again, to help us see what the whole issue is. Not the will of God but the will of man. I'd like to begin reading here then in the first verse of Mark 2. And again he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was knowing that he was in the house. And straightway many were gathered together, insomuch that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. That was a crowded out meeting there. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Someone's home in Capernaum, somewhere in Capernaum. Many people were gathered together. Insomuch, Mark says, that there was no room to receive them, not even outside the door. And he preached the word unto them. Notice that the signs and miracles are always preceded by the faithful preaching of the word. It's the hearing of the word that creates faith, Paul teaches in Romans 10 and verse 17. It's the hearing of the word that creates faith in the hearts of the people who have the need out there so that they can receive from God. He preached the word unto them. And they come unto him. Now, the scene is moved. We just were told in verse 2 that the house is packed out, the meeting has already begun, and Jesus is in the middle of his message preaching the word. Now, the scene changes, verse 3. They come unto him. Well, who's the they? Well, you've just got to read the rest of the verses, and we pick up a signed story that's being carried out on the streets leading up to wherever this meeting place is. Bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, you see, the meeting is already in place. The meeting is already taking place. When they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was, And when they had broken it up, and in the process broken up the meeting, they let down the bed wherein the sick of palsy lay. Now there's a man who wants to receive from God. All of his theological problems and questions have already been solved. They've already been answered in his own mind. Now it's time to act and do something about it. And that's the whole thing. Sometimes you hear this. A lot of times Mark 2 is used as a text supporting the fact that one of the principles of faith is that you have to act on your faith. Well, we're just saying it from another, from another angle. That's what willingness is all about. You, everything has already been made up, and now it's time to do something about it. You've already answered all of the problems or questions that you have or have had 
about divine healing, about God's will. Well, what about the fact that, let's see, Elisha had a bald head over there in uh, 2 Kings. And, you know, David said in Psalm 103 that he restores my youth as the eagles. And so let's see, Elisha had a bald head. So let's see, I wonder if that would mean that divine healing doesn't work for today. You see, all of those passages you run across in your daily Bible reading, all those, you already, you already settle. If you, haven't, if you haven't minutely answered every one of those to your own satisfaction, you've got the general picture. It doesn't matter to me whether he had a bald head or a head full of hair. I know what God has promised in his word for me, and that's divine healing. So we'll leave Elisha with his bald head, and I'll go on into the kingdom believing in divine healing. Maybe you've even studied that out and got your mind made up on it. Maybe it doesn't make any difference to you. So once all that's done, now it's time to do something about it. Amen. Right? That's what these men are doing here. You've got five men, four friends, and the man who has a need. And what friends they must have been, being willing to tote him around from point A to B, his house, to the meeting place, try to get in. They couldn't because of the press. I don't know how hard they tried. I guess if you've got a mob around the door then you don't really try too much. You can't get through that. be easy maybe for one man to slip through, but four, carrying a man on a stretcher, there's no way. And so you look around trying to figure out, well, now what am I going to do here? What am I going to do? You see one person, person A, would just give up and say, well, guess we missed God. I thought there was going to be a healing line where they prayed for the sick. Maybe there is, but we'll never get in it because look, the crowd around. One person just gives up, goes on back home. Well, you know, here I claimed my loved one's salvation and I went and witnessed to him the next day and they threw me out of the house. <laughs> so I guess that won't work then. I guess I'll just give up on that promise. No way. Some people, you know, try something. Well, it doesn't work, so I'm just going to give up. And other people look for other ways to make it work, to make it happen. Amen. I don't mean in some fleshly way, but you're demonstrating I really believe what God has said here. Amen. This young man here and his four friends really believe that he's going to get healed or he's not going to make a fool and a spectacle of himself climbing up on this house and opening up the roof and going down there to have Jesus touch him and for him to get nothing. He knows he's going to receive from God. So back into verse 4, when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. When they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of palsy lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, well, faith is something that's spiritual and invisible. You can't see faith. You could see faith on a page because it'd be spelled F-A-I-T-H. But you can't see faith. But you can see faith in action, though. You can see a person's will in action whenever they do something about what they say. They're willing to receive. He said unto the sick of palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven. And he got a double blessing. He went to get healed and he got salvation and healing. Which is always the way that it is. That's what we call the full gospel. Anything less than that is just a partial view of the atonement in the gospel. Uh, but there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. There are always religious people around who find fault with God and his wonderful works. Why did this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your hearts? Let me ask you a question. Is it easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee? Or to say, Arise and take up thy bed and walk? But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. Then he turns and says to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise and take up thy bed, and go thy way into thine house. And immediately he arose and took up the bed and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed, all but the Pharisees, and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. I guess they'd never seen the human will in action on that fashion. People just playing around, hoping maybe that Jesus would come by them and hoping maybe that something might happen if they would just stay around long enough instead of pressing in to God's fullness and pressing in to God's blessings. You know, all it takes is a reading of a passage like this. And Paul tells us that faith comes by hearing the word of God. Romans 10, 17. Amen. This man pressed in. 
And we're told that Jesus said, Arise, take your bed up and go to your house. Go back to the place from whence you came. In verse 12, we read immediately that healing was affected. Now, we're not teaching some instant manifestation doctrine here where you instantly have a manifestation all the time. But probably, as I think I have also said before, people would probably have some more instant manifestations if they would just press in and hang on and say, this is the way that's going to be. Hallelujah. Instead of expecting for a trial and expecting for a lengthy delay and expecting for the worst. You expect for whatever now. If it doesn't happen the way you thought or expected for it to happen, then go on believing anyway. This isn't a 100% immediate manifestation teaching that I'm trying to give you here. But the Bible, I mean, let's stay with what the Word says. Jesus pronounced healing and immediately he arose and took up his bed. Why can't that happen today then? It doesn't have to happen every time, but why can't that happen today? When they say you're healed and you're healed, not tomorrow, but now, and you can arise and take your bed, that's what the Bible says. Let's make sure we stay with what the Bible says. Immediately he arose and then left. Now, there were a lot of people who were amazed over that and who glorified God. I don't think that every single person there, the Pharisees, the scribes back in verse 6, they might have been amazed, let's say that, but I doubt they glorified God. Oh, amen. No way. Amen. They may have even said, we never saw it on this fashion, so let's lock this guy up. We've never had such a heretic and a radical around here. So if they said we never saw it on this fashion, they didn't mean what maybe you or I would mean or maybe what some other Jewish people meant we never saw it on this fashion. And remember the case over there in uh, the Gospel of John. They found fault with the man because he got healed on the wrong day and was carrying his bed around on the wrong day. On the wrong day. A man who's been afflicted all of these years. I mean, can't you bend your little legalistic interpretation just for a moment and rejoice with this man over two score years of affliction and now he's been healed Amen. as a result of the prayer of faith. And they found fault because you're carrying your bed on the Sabbath. You're carrying your bed on the Sabbath. They found fault, remember, with the blind man in John 9 who got healed there, and they cast him out of the synagogue. And his parents were such cowards, they wouldn't even give a response. They said, he's of age, ask him, because they knew the Jews had already agreed that if any man confesses, on Je confesses Jesus, out he goes, out of the synagogue. And the blind man, you know, turns the theological tables on those scribes, and, oh, you were all together born in sins, and would you teach us? They said, they cast him out. Well, I believe, like with the, the man there in, in John 9, the blind man, and the man here in Mark 2, that those of us who are on the receiving end of the promises of God are always going to be despised by the religious community out there. A scripture was read tonight that we should glory in only one thing, not in the might and the power and the riches, because that's the very thing that brings doom to so many people out there. But glory in this, that we understand and we know God, that we actually know him. We're back to our theme of knowledge there, that we know God, that we understand both his works and his ways. Some people know a thing or two about his works, but not his ways. We understand Psalm 103, his works and his ways. He showed his works unto the children of Israel, but his ways unto the prophet Moses. You have to go a little deeper to understand all of the ways of God. So you say, well, you said earlier you're going to give us some keys to a faith that receives. Well, we're seeing it here. Let me give you one of, the first of those, and we'll kind of work our way through some other passages and see all of these manifested, either explicitly or we know that they're there anyway. The first key to a faith that receives from God, the first, first key to really activating or one way by which you know that your will is activated in the right sense, is that you're going to be the first one in line. Now, I don't just mean numerically there, although sometimes first has to mean first, but that's going to be your mentality and your attitude, the first in line. I mean, think of it like this. If, if God is there, if the healer, the Savior, the Lord Jesus is there, and you have a need, would you just kind of mosey in, walk maybe to the back somewhere, get way in the back of the line? Or if you were really believing that you're going to receive and you really had a need. I mean, it goes back to what I said. One of the themes here is a the theme of desperation, not some half-crazed, lunatic-type desperation, but the desperation says, I've got a need. I know who can supply the answer, and I'm going to receive. And there's nothing and there's no one who's going to keep me back. 
not some religious institution, not some denominational tradition, not some of man's teaching, not the fear of other people around me, what they think about me or what they might say if I do something extreme. There's nothing and there's no one who's going to keep me back. That's what this man, that was the attitude he had. I want to be the first one there. And as a result, I don't read about a healing line. I read about a message being preached. He preached the word unto them. And it was during the message. The man interrupted the message and received his healing as a result. It's very important that, and this is a key to a faith that receives from God, is that you're first in line. You're first in line. You're first in line. Then turn over to chapter 5. We'll see another example of this. Chapter 5 and verse 24. A theme of desperation, a theme of being radical in receiving from God, as we see in Mark 2. The key to being first in line, of having, of having that spirit of faith, if numerically, I mean, we can't all be the absolutely first one in line. I mean, Paul talks, for instance, over in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, that many run in a race, and they all run so that someone can win, but only one receives the prize. Well, only one? Well, he doesn't mean only one individual. Well, in the natural, the natural analogy, that's true. Only one person, one individual can win the prize. But he's writing to a whole group of Christians there. And he's saying that, that the first one is the one who receives the prize. So he couldn't mean numerically. That'd be only one person in the church of Corinth could ever make it in. For the continuation of this message, please turn the tape over. One, well, he doesn't mean only one individual. Well, in the natural, the natural analogy, that's true. Only one person, one individual can win the prize. But he's writing to a whole group of Christians there. And he's saying that, that the first one is the one who receives the prize. So he couldn't mean numerically. That'd be only one person in the church of Corinth could ever make it in. It's, it's, the, it's the people who have the first in line mentality, who have the spirit of faith that Paul speaks of in 2 Corinthians 4.13. The spirit of faith that will not be denied, that is first in line, that doesn't sit back and speculate and wonder and worry. And the opposite, the one who doesn't try to produce some fleshly deed, well, I'm just going to run up there and try to get something, be the first one. Maybe there's something mystical and special about being the first one in a healing line. You see, if that's your only attitude, you probably won't get anything when you stand in a healing line to receive from God. You could numerically be the last one, but if your, if your spirit is a spirit of faith, it's the first in line. I'm going to receive. That's what I mean by first in line. You're not just playing around, waiting. Well, I don't want to bother the master. I don't want to trouble the Savior. And he's got many other things. People just broke in and interrupted him. And you're going to be accused if you have this type of spirit of a lot of things like, well, immaturity and a non-reverent attitude towards spiritual matters and so forth. But those are the only people portrayed in the Gospels in a favorable light because they're the only ones who receive from God. The ones who sit around and say, well, you know, I don't want to interrupt or I don't... You see, this man broke right into the meeting and Jesus said, son, be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven you. There wasn't any inconvenience to stop the message. And he stops it on a note of joy when he tells the man, praise God, be of good cheer. You just got your sins forgiven you. See, I didn't see that pronounced on any of those other people out there. I mean, that's some good news whenever you hear your sins are, you just got saved. All of your sins are forgiven you. That, that, that result, that equals salvation, does it not? And how did this man get it? There were a whole lot of people around hearing that word. But remember, Jesus had a throng of people around him, multitudes of people around him. And he gave parables like the parable of the sower to show that there are different categories or types of people depending on the depth of the soil in their life or the fertility of their heart. There may be a lot of people, a crowd that follows him. But he said, not to the multitude there, but to that one man, today salvation has come to you. Be of good cheer. Salvation is yours. You just got saved. And how did he get it? By breaking up that roof. Remember Zacchaeus over in, what is it, Luke 19? He climbed up in a tree just so he could get a special look at Jesus. 
And Jesus came by and looked up and said to him, he was a man of little stature, that's why he was up and not down, come down because salvation has come to your house this day. That's another one of those, you know what? You just got saved. What made him get saved there? His attitude. Whenever Jesus saw his attitude, he's hungry and he's thirsty, then he gives us a promise that if you're hungry and thirsty, you'll be filled. Whatever you're hungering after, you're going to get. Whatever you're thirsty for, you're going to get. When he looked up and saw that man, of all the other people, there's a small man who could have said, well, I'm not going to, you know, these parades, enough of these parades. We small people can't see the object of everyone's attention. He said, I'm going to figure out some way to do something about it. We're not talking about manifesting some fleshly action or deed. That's in the spirit there, to climb up in the tree to see Jesus. Prove that is, Jesus stops and says, come down, salvation has come to your house. Well, here in Mark 5, here we go again, verse 24, Jesus went with him and much people followed him and thronged him. There are always people around Jesus. And I guess that's one of the things we're getting at here, that that's, that's one of the things that God has so ordained to be around Jesus to prove whether or not we're going to press in and receive from him. There are always, in other words, various external excuses why we can't get this or can't have that or receive from God. A crowd is always around him. Now, not everyone in the crowd is receiving from him, but there's a crowd always around him, a crowd of people around. Think of the crowds that are in Christian colleges and seminaries today trying to receive Bible knowledge and receive truth, just crowds all around him. Crowds of radio preachers and people who listen to radio preachers, crowds of people around. Crowds of people in some faith and healing service. And I think, however, that the statistics are rather low. When you add everything up at the end of the day, the statistics are rather low because it's not the will of God. That's settled forever in heaven. It's the will of man. And that's settled day by day, case by case, person by person. Verse 25, and a certain woman... That was a certain man over in Mark 2, and a certain woman which had an issue of blood 12 years and had suffered many things of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was nothing better but rather grew worse. She not only grew worse, she grew tired, sick and tired of being sick and tired. Amen. She grew sick and tired of paying people and not getting anything as a result of that. So she gave up on them and found a better source. When she had heard of Jesus... She came in that throng, verse 24, that press, verse 27. She came in the press. There was a press over in Mark 2, remember, so that there was no room, not even around the door, for people to enter in. She came in the press behind and touched his garment, for she said, if I may but touch his clothes, I shall be whole. Now, that may not look like a lot, to you there, but again, if you put yourself in her condition of having to press through these people, uh, you read books and commentaries that say that there were some remnants of superstition in this woman, that she felt there was something uh, magical about Jesus' garments or whatever, but she didn't. There, there was no superstition in her. Uh, we're told in verse 27 that she had heard of the message of Jesus. I take that in the biblical scripture away. She knew that she could get healing from him. And she had such faith in him that I don't have to have him come to me and do something or say something. This is a manifestation of her faith. All I had to do is get to the place where I can touch his garment. She had already made up her mind. For she said, I think, what, what was this? Back in Deliverance, I guess, whenever we studied uh, verses uh, 7 and 8 and 9 along in there in Mark 5. Uh, it's in the past tense here. For she had said... For she had said, she had already made up her mind. Here's what she had said to herself. If I can touch his clothes, then my trial is over. And so she did just that, and that's what happened. Straightway, the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. Again, what's the, what's the idea here? She's first in line. I don't read of other people touching him. 
Now, we may on some other occasions, like over in, I don't know, Matthew 15 or somewhere, that other people touched him and got healed. Uh, maybe they learned from this woman. Maybe she was the first one to do it. But she did it anyway. And she's written down as an example in Scripture of those who exercise their will to receive from God. She didn't just think, well, he's uh, out there. There are too many people, and so I don't want to do anything about it. She got out there. A woman who had an unclean, a Levitically unclean condition, a bleeding condition, who was not supposed to be outside touching other people. Every person she brushed up against, they became unclean. She wasn't supposed to do that. She was supposed to stay separate. You read Leviticus uh, 12 and Leviticus 13, and you see that. She was supposed to remain separate. She goes right out there violating uh, a Levitical ceremonial law so that she can receive from God. Now, we can't ever violate some eternal moral law of God to receive from him, but you have to violate a whole lot of man's traditions and man's laws and man's technicalities to ever hope to receive from God. That's all that we're trying to say, and that's exactly what we're trying to say in these studies. God's will, the question of God's will has been settled. The question now is, are we really willing and ready to receive from God? So the first key is to be first in line. Not some fleshly manufactured deed of running up after the message so that you can be the first one or the first one to do this or the first one, although that doesn't hurt as long as it's in the Spirit. But you have the Spirit of faith that you're the first one in line type of mentality. And haven't we said around here, this is one thing that's characterized our teaching and ministry for the last 10 years, this, this spirit of desperation of being radical in what you do. We all picked up and moved from another state to move here for one reason, because we felt impressed of the Holy Spirit to do that. And we're criticized by people who should know better than to criticize people who hear from God and obey Him. We're criticized because, well, why did you do that? And I said, because God told us to. Well, I wonder why God told you to. Well, I don't guess that's any concern of mine. He has the plans, and he maps them out and says, do it, and we do it. And he can deal with everything else. I had someone the other day saying, well, now, you know, I heard that you moved, your whole church moved from Minnesota to Vermont. Now, so can you tell me why? Well, I said, well, yeah, because God told us to. That wasn't enough of an answer. For someone who's supposed to be in the Word and be a minister, and that's supposed to be enough of an answer for them because God told us to. Well, I wonder why God told you to. Well, what if I would have given you an answer to that? Then you would have said, well, I wonder why, and then you would have mentioned the answer. Then if I would have given you an answer to that, you would have said, well, I wonder why, the answer to the answer. There's no end of the question. So I simply looked at them and said, well, you know what? I said, I don't get my mind or intellect into things like that. That's where you miss God. <laughs> I said, we're not an intellectual people. We don't get our intellect or mind into things. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Well, you know, that's exactly true. That's the way that it happened. And we didn't get our mind or intellect into it. I didn't try to figure out why. Or Well, now that you're out here, have you figured out why? I'm not in the business of figuring things out. Praise God. Just go and do I mean, we could get our mind into it and give you this reason, or perhaps it was this, or, well, in the future it could be that, or, but, I mean, why even start? That's just, then you're into a, an endless race of answering a question upon a question upon a question. The Lord said do it, so we just do it. We obey Him. We just don't get our mind or intellect into it. And it hasn't hurt us to move. Praise God. It may benefit a lot of other people. They'd do something similar. Amen. They may find themselves more in the will of God then. Well, God's not telling me that. Well, maybe you're not listening. <laughs> it's easy to say, well, Holy Spirit hasn't told me. That's easy. That's putting all the burden back on God. Maybe you're not listening, though. Maybe the fault doesn't lie with God. The fault lies with you. Amen. So we were listening, and the Holy Spirit said, go, and so we went. Kind of like Israel traveled in the Old Testament supernaturally. Would it travel as well? And you got your faith proven by that, and you got your faith built up and strengthened by that. Amen. Trials are always good. They help you locate your faith or your lack thereof. 
So what I was saying is that somebody has characterized us in this church. We talk about sitting on the front row, and then we'll also say right after that, not everybody can sit on the front row. You'll be sitting in one another's laps. So there is a second and third row. But wherever you sit, I couldn't imagine being in this end-time walk and call and not have a first row mentality. I couldn't imagine. Wherever I go, I try to sit on the first row literally. That's just, that's my desire. You do whatever you want to. As they say, not everybody can sit on the front row. But we don't want to like water it down though, do we? We don't want to embarrass you, but we don't want to water it down. We just want to leave it just like that. Wherever you are, it has to be a front row mentality. Every time I talk about a front row mentality, some people might get a little stiff, especially people who are sitting on the back row. <laughs> people on the front row are just glowing. There are halos over their head. You know, we're, <laughs> we're here. We're doing the right thing. Well, you know, you may have a child. And you may have gotten in late or whatever. You got a proof text for getting in late, Mark, too. Those people got in late, but they broke the building up to get in, though. They came in the window and from under the floor and down the chimney is how they got in, not in the door. Well, amen. That's just the way I've always been. All these years, that's the way that I've been, and that's why some of us, I mean, let me, let me put it to you like this. That's why you can have two people in this overcomer's walk who are walking side by side, going along side by side with one another. One of them constantly receives from God, and one of them occasionally does. One of them constantly receives from God, one of them occasionally does. I mean, you have to at least occasionally receive, or you're not even in this overcomer's walk. But you can be in this overcomer's walk and you're not growing, you're not maturing as God wants you to, and there's still that apathy there. But you can have two people going along side by side in this overcomer's walk, and one's constantly receiving from God, and the other is occasionally being blessed. You know, every now and then, here and there, something happens in their favor. And for the one who's just going all out for God, the one who's just believing for everything, you know, I don't think you can believe for too much. Amen. You can't be believing for too much. Amen. Don't ever be afraid of that. Don't ever let somebody browbeat you or intimidate you into lessening what you're believing for. Most people are believing for too little. I think I read, to give you a, a scriptural, spiritual analogy, I think I read of an account over in the book of Second Kings where the prophet Elisha was told to bring one of the kings before him and he put him before the window, said, open the window, open it, take a bow, took a bow, take an air, take an air, shoot, he shot. And he said, now that's a, that, that is the, that is the uh, arrow of victory. That's the arrow of the Lord's victory. Now, now smite your arrows on the ground. One, two, three, and he stayed. And the man of God was angry and rough with him. He should, said you should have hit the ground over and over and over again. Then the Lord would have completely annihilated your enemies. Now he'll only set them back three times. You see, you can't believe for too much. You can't believe for too much. I'd rather get, I'd rather get into the kingdom and have the Lord have to tell me you were just believing for way too much, more than I was able to do, which is impossible. With God, nothing is impossible, you see. You never overload him. But I'd rather, to use that illustration, I'd rather enter the kingdom saying, you just believe for way too much. You were too radical. You were too zealous. You, just, you tried to get the front row everywhere you went. That just wasn't fair to the other people who also wanted the front row. I'd rather be told that than say, why, you old slothful sluggard. Why did I give you those things and you went with your little talent that I gave and you went and hid it somewhere because you said, well, I don't know, I want to be reverent and have a reverent attitude toward God. You know, I don't want to be too radical or zealous because I might offend God. Really, we, what we mean by that is I might offend someone around me and then they, I might suffer a little persecution for offending someone around me. So, you know, this woman in Mark 5, the man in Mark 2, there's one thing that you're going to have to remember concerning this business of the human will and your will as you receive from God, and that is that you're going to be misunderstood and criticized by a lot of people. I've experienced a boatload of that from the left and from the right. I mean, from people who are way out of it and people who are supposed to be way into it. If you just manifest this, this spirit of zeal, 
of being radical, of being desperate. Who was it? It Was it Rachel back in Genesis chapter 30, I believe in verse 1? She was jealous with her sister Leah. Leah, you know, the one who was not as beautiful as Rachel, was the one who was doing all this childbearing. And so Rachel became jealous. And what did she say to her husband? I think it's in Genesis 30 and verse 1. Give me children or else I die. Now, maybe her motives competing with her sister are less than pure. But her zeal is commendable, though. Amen. Her motives might be less than pure and leave a lot to be desired. Childbearing competition with your sister. It's not the purest of motives to want to have a child. But at least her zeal and her desires were genuine. She's told her husband, give me children or else I die. Now, is that our attitude toward the promises of God? Give me the answer to the promise or else I die. Not like, well, I'm just going to, well, I don't know what will happen, but I mean, that's the end because there's nothing else that will satisfy me. Give me Jesus, give me the answer to the promises, or that's it. Amen. I can't make it, I can't last. Because we have determined in ourselves not to depend on ourselves, not to depend on some fleshly alternative or substitute, so you see, whenever you've cut off all your alternatives and you've burned all your bridges behind you, there's nothing left to trust but God alone. Amen. But God and God alone. And your cry has to be, as Rachel, give me the answer or else I die. Not in some selfish, complaining manner, but in the spirit of faith and zeal and of desperation. That's one thing you're going to have to be prepared for in this walk. Now, it's easy for me to stand up here tonight. Now, listen to me, friends, and say this. You're going to be prepared for this. It's another to be prepared and then not be too shocked whenever it happens. That you are going to be misunderstood and criticized by other people. I just gave an example. Our move from Minnesota to Vermont. Misunderstanding and criticisms have abounded over that. All we did was heard from God and did what he said to do. How could that be wrong? How could there be anything wrong with that? He said, move, well, how do I know that he told you to move? Well, how do I know that your name is Mike Jones? How do I know you're saved? Well, I, I, I know that I am. I don't care whether you know. How do I know? I mean, how do any of us know anything about anybody else if we can't trust their word? All you're doing is accusing people of being liars around you. If we can't trust somebody else's word, somebody tells me, you know, I'm baptized in the Spirit. Well, how do I know? Well, speaking tongues. Well, how do I know? Well, here we go. Jabber, jabber. Well, how do I know that's real? How do I know? How do I know? I could ask the same question about anybody else in any other area. <laughs> Misunderstandings and criticisms will swirl around you. It's not as though you enjoy them, maybe you have to learn to live with them. Not to say maybe you learn to enjoy them in one sense, but learn to live with them. They'll swirl around you and abound. We had just, have just seen it here in Mark chapter 2. Oh, no. And I've already given you some of these other examples in John 5 and John 9. Oh, no. Criticisms abounds by the religious leaders around, the people who receive healing from Jesus. Carrying your bed on the Sabbath day. You know, forgetting the fact that a miracle has been done and this man has been restored to health. You're violating, you know, canon law number 18, code 72, paragraph 13 in book 8. You violated that. And Jesus said, why, you fools, are you more willing on the Sabbath day to lift one of your own animals out of a pit into which he falls, and yet you won't rejoice over a man being made every whit whole on the Sabbath day? Why, he penetrated the hypocrisy of the people around him. Yeah. Constantly, he penetrated their hypocrisy. And, uh, well, a lot of that hypocrisy, I think, still abounds around us today. The woman here in Mark... Chapter 5, again, could easily be criticized, violating some Old Testament law out in public, unclean woman, running issue, an issue of blood, bothering Jesus. I mean, a lot of times people just, well, let's turn over. I'll give you another one. If you go over to Matthew chapter 20, a lot of people say, don't bother the Lord. Really, they mean, don't bother us. Your zeal rings too loudly in our ears. You know, it's like scraping your fingernails on a chalkboard. If you're zealous, because so few people in the Christian walk are zealous. When God says move, they move. When God says jump, they jump. When God says stand, they stand. When God says do it, they do it. Amen. When God says receive your healing, they receive their healing. 
When God says, be saved, they're saved. When he says, be filled with the Spirit, they're filled. When he says, speak in tongues, they speak in tongues. Whenever he says, do it, they do it. People are offended over that. They say now, don't bother God, but really they mean, don't bother me. You're bothering me. Your zeal, you know, light makes darkness manifest, we're told in John chapter 3. And people love darkness, the cover of it, because it hides their own lack of zeal. It hides their own unspirituality. It hides their own inadequacy, spiritually speaking. They don't like it when there's a people around them who are zealous for spiritual matters. And yet that's what the Bible is commanding over and over and over again. That's the whole key to being willing to receive from God is that you're zealous to receive from God. Now, the cases are few and far between of somebody who's just passively reclining by the roadside and gets a supernatural touch from the Lord in the Gospels. They generally have to go out of their way to get something from him. To do something foolish like touch the hem of his garment or break up a perfectly good roof and so forth. Matthew chapter 20, verses 30 through 34. First key, I said, is to be first in line. And I'm saying that if you're first in line, if that's your attitude, if you have a front row mentality, you're going to be misunderstood and criticized by other people. And you just have to be prepared for it. That's why you have to have the teaching on love at the same time so that you don't lose your cool and uh, become unloving towards someone. Love endures everything and it goes to the very end. But uh, love doesn't compromise its faith because someone else has been offended by something. Amen. It maybe just presses down a little harder. <laughs> I've been accused of that. <laughs> I've been accused of making situations worse because someone wants to make an issue of it. I'll say, you haven't even heard half of what it's really all about. Let me tell you the rest of it. You think you've got problems? Let me tell you the whole story now. You know, I've always been the type, if you want something to criticize, then don't criticize something not true. Let me supply you with some ammunition here. Let me give you something to really be critical of. They don't know how to handle that. I had someone tell me, we haven't figured out yet what to do with you. I don't think they meant that in a good sense. If I felt I were wrong in some area, I would repent and change, to be sure. Amen. We want to be holy and we want to be scriptural in our life. But if you're right, you're right. And you can't bow or compromise. And so you're going to have people, I'm sure some of you have already had this experience, say to you, we don't know what to do with you. Amen. 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 We, we don't know what, we don't know, we haven't, the category, the pigeonhole for your type hasn't been created yet. <laughs> it has not been discovered by man yet. And as I say, you know, you may be accused of that by people on the left and people on the right, especially people on the left. We, we, and we would, you know, we should grow to expect that. And you can just be happy and smile through it and say, well, I'm a rare species or whatever. That people just don't know what to do with you. You really believe all these things. I mean, you're really, wow, I just never met anybody like you before. And then you find some old stalwarts in the faith who have a few barnacles growing on them. They're the ones on the right. And they don't know what to do with you. You mean you hadn't gotten old and stale and crusty like the rest of us? No. Well, how many years have you been in this? Surely not over three. And then you, they find out you've been in longer than they have. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. You see, a lot of other people, that, that's their whole problem. Their, their mentality, whether they realize this or not, is you mean you haven't become old and stale like the rest of us. Anybody who gets in this walk, if you get in with both feet, which is the only way to get in it, in your first year, you maybe even did things that were so zealous then they were zeal lacking in knowledge and wisdom, and you might not do that again, but you don't want to surrender the zeal that compels you to do whatever you did. And yet there are other people who also got into it and who did some things that were more zealous than wise. And so they think now, five, ten years later, I'm going to learn from my mistake. And so rather than just getting more wisdom so that what they do in zeal, they do with wisdom, they surrender their zeal. They get their feet planted in the cement. They don't want to go anywhere with God or do anything too strange or too radical. People might say that that's, such and such. I can't, you can't, you know, you just got to grow accustomed to the fact you can't help what everybody's going to say about you. That's just part and package 
of the blessing of following Jesus. It's not up, it's up to you to, to live a holy life, to be godly, to be righteous, not to go out of your way to make people have difficulties. But at the end of the day, it's not your calling to try to explain yourself and justify yourself to everybody around you and wonder, now, if I do this, I wonder what are people going to say. Just obey the Lord and trust that he'll work all the details out. And I'm sure that he will. Well, verse 30, Behold, two blind men sitting by the wayside, when they heard that Jesus passed by, cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, thou son of David. Two blind men, they've got a need. Now, they're not just sitting there. They cry out. And look what they get, verse 31. They get a little rebuke from the multitude around. Shut up, don't bother him. Cut that yelling and hollering out. Cut that foolishness and nonsense out over there. After all, this is the Savior. <laughs> That'd be our whole argument. That's, this is the Savior. That's why I'm doing the yelling that I'm doing to get his attention. He saves men. That's why we call him the Savior. You'll be accused of being brash and selfish and immature and non-reverent. Well, that's exactly what all these people who received from God in Jesus' day were accused of. If, if not uh, explicitly, they are in so many words, non-reverent. Well, why would you think the multitude would rebuke them? Well, this is the Messiah. This is the Lord. You know, you've got to be quiet around him. You haven't been to church if you haven't been told that church is a place to be quiet. And the Bible says over and over, church is not a place to be quiet. Amen. Church is a place to sing God's praises. Right. The multitude rebuked them because they should hold their peace. But they cry the more. Amen. Now, that's just the way it's going to have to be for a person who receives from God. That's the way it is in my life. When people tell you to shut up, you just start talking the more. <laughs> when they say, grow up, then you just act more immature if you have to, to abase yourself before men so that God can exalt you. So you've got to keep that first in line mentality, that front row mentality. That's why, you know, we're saying to you constantly around here that you've got to stay with us. I mean, I, I, I notice over the years that well, as I've said already tonight, that as people grow in this walk, and see, if it happens to the minister, then you're in double jeopardy because his attitude and spirit is going to be communicated to all of the people. This message will be continued on the following tape.